Hot damn, everybody. Welcome back to the highway with Kyle Shutt. Oh, man. This week we got one of the gods, Mr. Bill Steer from Carcass, one of my favorite guitar players in the world. It was so hard not to just totally punish this guy for 40 minutes. Carcass has a new record out right now. It's called Torn Arteries, and I can promise you that it is better than your last album. As always, if you like what you've been hearing on the program, go ahead and hit that button, ring that bell, fry that chicken. You do whatever it is you got to do to make sure you don't miss a single episode. And if you want to go one step further, you can find us at patreon.com slash the highway. For just a couple bucks a month, you can help me keep this train rolling. Get yourself a shout out on the program or even some guitar lessons or some, or some crazy ass merchandise. I don't know anymore. We also got to spread some holiday cheer for our sponsors, Heil Sound. Because if you like the way I sound, it's because there's a Heil in front of me. I got to interview one of my guitar heroes today and lucky you, you get to listen. Let's do things my way. The Highway. What's going on, Bill? How we doing, man? I'm doing fine, man. It's so good to hear from you. I haven't seen you in like 10 years, I think. Yeah, well, yeah, it's certainly a number of years. How have you been? I've been fine, man. Thanks, dude. Uh, really excited about your new record. Uh, you just keep getting more brutal. Uh, yeah, Torn Arteries uh, <laughs> just came out a few months ago. You know what? Uh, my my favorite thing about Carcass is, um, is that you guys come back about every eight or so years to just remind everybody that their band sucks. <laughs> <laughs> well that's that's flattery <laughs> thanks <laughs> no man i just uh yeah uh the record came out and i was thinking about uh just uh, all my guitar heroes that i wanted to have on and uh i can say with uh, the full confidence that you are one of my absolute favorite guitar players um ever since i've found uh, heart work uh at a cd store when i was maybe like 17 or 18 i just was fucking blown away uh by your tone so it's a real pleasure to have you on man thanks for coming on Oh, thank you for having me. I appreciate that. Yeah, but uh, are you uh, still in London? Still in London? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I've been here forever. God, um, <laughs> it's weird. It's, it's a place I never expected to live, but um, I sort of moved here almost by accident and have scarcely left since. <laughs> it's nuts. <laughs> But uh, where, whereabouts are you right now? Uh, I'm back in Texas, uh, kind of a little, little town north of Austin, and uh, yeah, it's 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 been a real pandemic, you know. But uh, the yeah. uh, the sword just uh, recently saddled up and uh, hit the road with Primus, uh, playing a whole Rush album. So it's uh, it's so good to be back out touring, <laughs> man. It was uh, we we had taken a hiatus that kind of turned into like a three year break just because the pandemic extended everything and uh so god i just I yeah yeah can't tell you how much i missed playing music uh are y'all uh making plans to support the record yeah um yeah we are roughly speaking um there's a festival coming up um in the north of england up in leeds uh next weekend so that would be the first thing that we've done in goodness 20 something months not not quite two years but it's a long time i think the the last time uh we caught carcass uh, was at the it was the sound on sound festival it used to be the fun 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 fest and you guys went on like right as the flash flood <laughs> totally like came through the fairground oh god <laughs> <laughs> i know that see there's a uh, we all had to get the hell out of there but uh, that seemed uh, pretty scary what was it what was that like being on stage watching that happen you know, I, I mean, I'm ashamed to say it. I have no recollection <laughs> of this whatsoever. <laughs> well, well, that's okay. Um, tour, tour kind of blends together sometimes, you know. Yeah. Yeah, completely. I mean, it, I don't know how this works, but there are some festivals we've done that are clear memories to me. Um, the whole day and the performance and so forth. But uh, but there's, there's many more that just, uh, just some, for some reason, I can't access those memories. I don't know why. Well, sometimes if well, it's I have a, my suspicions as to why, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, especially if it's like a really shitty show, you just kind of block it out, move on to the next one. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah, totally. But uh, I was um, a, a huge fan of uh, grindcore or whatever you want to call it, just extreme music when I was um, growing up. Uh, when I was about sixteen or seventeen, somebody gave me a, a Converge CD, and I just sort of never turned back from there. And um, from mm. that, getting into you know bands like Napalm and Carcass and everything like that. Um, was sort of how I got into it, but that was all through 
you know the internet and and word of mouth and stuff but um you know you and lee and mick and everybody like you just uh, created this um this monster you know and uh, i just uh, i have a mountain of respect for y'all and i just wanted to know um you know just coming coming out of the punk scene in in the uk and everything like that and uh bands like discharge and stuff what uh what was it that made you want to create just such extreme music well i mean i guess firstly i should uh slightly qualify that because um i i wasn't really in the punk scene Mm -hmm. i mean i guess i i'd started hanging out with punk guys who are a bit older and that's part of the trajectory that got me to the point where i was in napalm but really my background was you know just growing up with heavy rock and heavy metal um so yeah I started to like punk music when I was swapping records with with my friends and um the crossover thing was happening at that time um so it it was it was definitely an exciting period to be into this music because all of a sudden it felt like the whole thing was twice as big because punks and metal people were listening to each other's music and just getting together at gigs and stuff that was that was a really nice time um I've completely forgotten what what was the remainder of your question. Oh no, Sorry. no! I was just, uh, just uh, it's it's awesome just hearing that, like you not really being into punk and like bring, but bringing that flair of like kind of classic rock and like shredding and stuff to the um, just to to, to that uh, end of uh, what they were bringing to the table, like with uh, Mick just playing drums faster than anybody ever had at that point. And uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, we all know that there were bands out there in the underground. Um, particularly on the hardcore punk side of the fence, who were playing extremely fast. I mean, um, in the UK, there was Heresy, um, but but way before that, you had bands in the USA, like Siege and Deep Wound and so on. So all of those things led up to, to the thing that became Napalm, really. Um, I think timing is, is a huge issue. And for some reason, particularly here, really kicked off people were ready for that that type of music at that time but we were certainly we, we weren't fooling ourselves we knew that we we were just part of a uh, what's the word you know like a chronology of music it's not like we'd invented anything we were just part of something a continuum or something mm-hmm. and uh, another just awesome part of that too was uh, taking that all the way to uh, the BBC One on the the John Peel show, <laughs> which is absolutely crazy. I never got to do that. He he had passed by the time uh, the sword uh, had kind of uh, become prominent uh, enough to do something mm. like that. But yeah, what, oh god, what was that like? Yeah, that was quite mad because he was just such a a well known figure. Um, I mean, as, as more of a kind of rock person the the dj i grew up with was was tommy vance who did the friday rock show so that that was more geared towards heavy rock the mm-hmm. early heavy metal progressive stuff and then i was well aware of john peel but that wasn't really my bag because that was more kind of um alternate quote unquote alternative music uh-huh. uh the burgeoning indie scene and and punk and new wave and so forth um but i was very aware of the guy um so yeah, it was just insane that we were doing a BBC session, going into those studios in Maida Vale, um, with some very esteemed recording engineers. The the whole thing was just bonkers. But when you're you know 17 or so, you take those things in your stride because you know everything's weird at that stage in life anyway. Right. And because uh, uh, you've been, uh, or at least vegetarian for a long time, and uh, even uh, vegan for a while. But <laughs> thinking about like uh, you know being a teenager back in those days being vegan must have been really hard yeah yeah you just said it it really was um it was pretty much just surrendering yourself to a a kind of starvation diet Um, (laughs) because yeah i mean we we were well you know we were very devout so you know we stuck with it but um yeah, well, a, lot I mean, chips, huh? I, a lot of chips. A lot of chips. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly, exactly that. Because I mean, when we first toured mainland Europe with Napalm, um, yeah, we didn't, you know, because th- things weren't as globalized back then. So you'd get to a different country, and everything was different. Mm-hmm. I mean, never mind the language, just just the food that was on offer. So yeah, I mean, we were eating 
uh, I mean, I remember doing a 10 day tour and only eating crisps pretty much, you know, well, you would say <laughs> chip, potato chips, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and that's, that's changed radically. Um, the first time carcass went to the U S it was very difficult to, to be vegan. And now it's like the best place on earth to be vegan. So things have really changed over the years, I guess. In that wild. Yeah. And, um, I've always heard that, um, that whenever heart work came out and, and you yeah, were, were touring on that and everything that, uh, that it really wasn't received very well. And that just, it's, it's mind blowing to me because that was just one of my, still one of my favorite records of all time. And, uh, for, for multiple reasons, one of the reasons is that I always read that y'all used a uh, 51 fifties, uh, on that record. Mm. And I've oh, never, yeah. I've never been able to get a good tone out of one of those. I don't know how you guys achieved that <laughs> tone with that thing, but, uh, that, and also, uh, just it, it, as, as the sword went on too, um, we found ourselves making records that we were insanely proud of. And then just for whatever reason, the scene just would like decide not to like that one or something. I just, I, I couldn't understand it. What mm. uh, was it? Was that really how it was? was it, did, did everyone just kind of like turn their backs on you around then? Well, I, I wouldn't say it was as, as dramatic as that, but mm. it was more like a, a slow tapering off of interest. Um, you know, it's not like things were great for the third record either. But mm -hmm. I think with hard work, yeah, there was a level of expectation from us anyway. Yeah. I don't know about the label, but def definitely from us. We just thought uh, we finally got the sound we wanted, the materials there. Um, but it just wasn't the right time for that album. I think we, we probably had a couple of good reviews, you know, mm -hmm. along the way. Um, but... But mostly, we were out there touring, and people were telling us the records stank. You know, yeah. <laughs> just like, call that and the, I mean, yeah. what can you do? I call it the German compliment. <laughs> you know, <laughs> when you go there, for whatever reason they come to you and it's like, "Yeah, your new record is terrible." Uh, you know, it's, it's awful. I wish you would only play the first record. But then they go to the merch table and they buy everything. And you're like, I don't know if we're about to fight or if we're friends now. You know, I don't know. Yeah, the the, the old German compliment. Yeah, that's, that's brilliant. I'd not heard that phrase before, but <laughs> well, yeah, it's, I, it's a little bit like that Larry David thing with, you know, having said that, you know, you set somebody up really nice, like, you're looking good. And then having said that, <laughs> and then you just unleash a tidal wave of, you know, just abuse. <laughs> <laughs> um, another thing I wanted to ask you about, because I've never really uh, heard much about it, but, um, and, and I don't even know if a lot of people know it, but the, the cover for Heartwork, I just absolutely love that album cover. And uh, not a lot of people don't know that it's an HR Geiger piece. Um, how did, yeah, that, how yep. did that come about? Y'all finding that? Or did you get to know him or anything like that? Or was it just strictly like a commission or anything like that? Well, um, we did meet him on a couple of occasions. Um, I mean, he was very nice to us. I mean, he invited us over to his house and stuff, and that was great. Wow. Um, but yeah, I think the way I remember this was he had um, a piece in one of his books, or whatever, that Jeff really wanted for the album cover. And when we asked, I think we, you know, our manager approached his manager, and the reply came back, "Yeah, you can, you can use one of his pieces, but he's he's done a new version of this piece." And we want you to use the new version. So that's the one that's on the record. If, I mean, if you look into it, the original version, it's its kind of the same image, but it's just a different thing stylistically. Interesting. Wow, yeah, I'm going to look that up. That's wild. Was this house really, like, like, super stylized? Well, you know, I to this day, I don't know for sure if that was his you know the house oh, okay. or if it was a house you know uh -huh. but it, i mean it, it was quite a modest residence um in wherever it was in switzerland i can't remember i mean i'm, I'm assuming zurich but my memory's shot to pieces but but yeah it was kind of smaller than you might expect so i'm guessing he maybe had somewhere else but this place was just absolutely jam-packed with with his ass so i mean you saw a lot of interesting things in there. i mean there was, there was a a poster he'd done for a, a Hells Angels anniversary or something, which was maybe the single, just to my taste, anyway, the single most eye-catching thing he'd done. Um, but there was just loads of stuff in there. I mean, it was just packed. And then I remember we were upstairs and there was a, a rack of records and looking at them. And from what I can recall, it was just entirely Miles Davis, the whole thing. Wow. I don't think there was a single other artist in it. It was just 
Miles Davis. <laughs> That's crazy. Are you a jazz fan? So he are, are you a jazz fan? He, well, he, you know what? I mean, this is going to sound terrible, but I kind of savor seventies fusion, like yeah, like especially if it's a drummer record, like a you know a Tony Williams or a Levy uh-huh. White. Um, or you know, I like you know some of that early Stanley Clark stuff. That that was that's probably the, the most comfortable I get because it you know there's a rock element to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about you? Oh, I, I absolutely love jazz. Any any kind of I just like all kind of music. I I, I have one rule. I don't listen to shit that sucks. You know what I mean? <laughs> any, <laughs> any genre can totally like shit the bed. Um, but uh, yeah. yeah, I absolutely love jazz. A uh, uh, guitar player, Wes Montgomery. He's one of my favorites. Uh, he played with a lot of like uh, octaves and things like that. I really, uh, I love. It. Yeah, I mean, uh, and it's all with the thumb as well, which is just crazy. I know, you and, know uh, just uh, the I amount of dexterity he gets. I, uh, I, I read this book uh, that was talking about that, and uh, he he played with his thumb. I knew that, but the reason he played with his thumb, he, uh, he apparently he hated his style um, because mm-hmm. he couldn't hold a pick because he had a giant corn on his thumb. And so like oh, that, I that was actually what he was strumming with the whole time. So he did all that crazy shit with like a weird growth on his thumb. <laughs> wow, that's brilliant. I know. I was like, it made me start to think like, well, maybe I should, you know, <laughs> start working <laughs> on some weird callus or something. No, mm-hmm. no, I'm not going to do that. But um, so w- once Carcass initially wound down, um, uh, didn't you, you move to Australia for a little bit, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I spent quite a bit of time there. I think the longest stretch without without leaving would have been only seven months or so. But uh, but for me, that was a big one because, of course, it's the opposite end of the earth yeah. if you live in the UK. Um, so you're not going to see your family or friends for a long time. So I think at that stage in, in my life, I was able to do it. If, if you asked me to do it now, it would have been, well, it would be near impossible right but is, is uh, it a thing where you yeah, it was great. visit and then you got stuck or and couldn't get back <laughs> I've, I've heard that well no no before. not exactly i mean it was sort of um it, you know it, it was a relationship thing and once i was there it, i mean it's a very comfortable place to live i mean people mm-hmm. have a great standard of, of living there um and especially if you're a brit there's so many things that are familiar to you mm-hmm. you know just little things that you see or experience every day they're just in a totally different context because obviously the weather's great and people are a lot happier. But um, yeah, I just I just really like the place. I still do, of course. Yeah. What city were you in? Well, the first time I ever visited um, as a sort of tourist or whatever you want to call it, would I spent more time in Richmond, near Melbourne. Mm-hmm. But that, that massive chunk of time where, you know, six, seven months went by, that was uh, uh, Sydney, like c- kind of near Bondi, you know, like near Tamarama Beach. That is one of the most beautiful parts of the planet. Yeah, a hundred percent, totally. I love it out there. We used to say like, like how, like what the rule is, of like um, how long you can wear your bathing suit um, inland. Like if you just start at the beach and then just keep walking inland, like how far before it's inappropriate? You know, because <laughs> you would see people <laughs> like just walking around in bikinis all day. I was like, man, Sydney fucking rules. <laughs> <laughs> but it's very expensive was it as uh, as expensive back in those days no no i don't recall it being like that i mm-hmm. think it, it was uh, especially compared to london anyway um it, it felt pretty easy going really i know it's it's changed it's, it's changed since then i know but um yeah it's just a nice thing to do and you know it's a fascinating part of the world and um, you know the the people there are great. You know the, the sense of humor is just off completely off the charts. <laughs> it was is that where you started uh, Firebird, or did, uh, was that after you moved back? No, I mean, I, I, you know, I had an attempt at getting a band together uh-huh. there and stuff, but it just it didn't really quite happen. And then when I moved to London, it still didn't quite happen. It took a while. Um, but yeah, I was definitely that was the, z- the zone I was in. Um, I was working towards something of that nature at that time, yeah. And that makes sense now that I, that I heard you talk about. You, you weren't so much on the punk side. You were more like the classic and the blues rock kind of like um, side of things. That makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. Um, did you ever get to meet any of your uh, your guitar heroes? I always uh, tell people, always meet your heroes. Um, and uh, I've, I've met quite a few. But uh, yeah, did you ever get to... Uh, you know, meet Richie Blackmore or anybody like that? Uh, <laughs> no, no, but now, just before we go into this, I'm just curious to know, so who have you met that was, you know, 
not disappointing. Well, um, I've talked about the Metallica tour that we did a lot. Uh, Kirk and, and James mm. were just uh, phenomenal gentlemen. You know, just it's just absolutely oh, cool. uh, rad to hang around. Um, uh, Pepper Keenan from uh, COC, yep. he's uh, just uh, one of the funniest people I've ever met. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, right. it's kind of. I've. Uh, I, I can talk about the ones I haven't met. Uh, I've. Uh, I've never met Tony Iommi. Uh, I've been in the same room with him, mm. and uh, and Kirk. Mm. Oh, yeah. uh, it was like a Metallica after party, and Kirk came up to me and he was like, "Hey, man, have you met Tony yet?" I was like, "No, I. I can't just go up to him. You have to like introduce me <laughs> <laughs> to him, man. I'm not gonna just totally. walk yeah, up I to the that, guy yeah. like, hey, I'm Kyle. Nobody really cares uh, mm. at this party.' But um, yeah, no, I've never met. Um, uh, I'd like to meet Joe Perry. I, th- I think he'd be fun to hang around. I, I was. I was a big Aerosmith fan when I was a kid. But um, I've been I've been fortunate enough to to have met quite a few. That's brilliant. Yeah, that's that's an impressive list, to be honest. <laughs> what about you? Well, God, I'm trying to think now. Um, I mean, in the world of uh, heavy metal and and what people call extreme metal now, I mean, yeah, I've definitely met a few in that zone. But where, you know, like whether it's you know. Kerry King from Slayer, or your mm-hmm. Gary Holt, for that matter. You know yeah. th- those kind of people. I mean, oh yeah, we we did meet the Metallica guys at some point in the nineties, and and James Hetfield was like everything you wanted him to be. Really, he was just charming and funny. Mm-hmm. Um, for like the older rock, I'm trying to think. Really, not too many. Um, I did meet Peter Green. Um, Damn. I was at I was at a Buddy Guy concert in London, and. Um, I was just coming down some stairs and he was coming up and it was just a reflex reaction. I sort of went to shake his hand and say, you know, thank, thank you for the music you've made. And, you know, I, I just didn't realize how, you know, gone he was mentally because, yeah. you know, he just wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't very happy that somebody had recognized him, quite frankly. Hmm. You know, which with that's totally fine, but yeah. um, it's, it's not going to, you know, change my opinion of his music. I mean, yeah, that's why I say you never know. Always, always meet your heroes if you get the chance. Just do it. You know, uh, I, I've blown a few opportunities, but that's that's on me. You know, but uh, yeah, yeah, good, yeah. <laughs> but um, and so we had actually uh, coming coming out of that, and then going into um, th- this is about the time when the sword started popping up. We got to be friends with uh, Lee Dorian because uh, uh, him, oh, cool. him and Will Palmer were wanting to put out um, uh, an EP or just just get involved somehow uh, with us, and uh, we ended up doing a split. Uh, with witchcraft uh oh, yeah, the yeah. rise above in the uk and then our label handled it in the u.s and everything like that but that mm. was that was um that was a real treat because like lee is just he's everything you'd think he would be he really <laughs> he's just like l- larger than life uh just uh totally us getting wasted getting kicked out of the crowbar it was just uh, I, I had a great time uh hanging out with him but um <laughs> great <laughs> But uh, then he started, you know, pitching his the bands that were on his label and, and things like that uh, for our tours and stuff. And we, uh, we ended up really liking Gentleman's Pistols. And they had, oh, yeah, they, yeah. They had a record out that we really liked. And uh, when it came time for us, uh, it was around the time Warfighters came out. Um, this would have been like 10 years ago, I guess, 10, 11 years ago. Um, and this is the last time I saw you. I didn't know that you had joined the band. You know, yeah. and, and so we like loaded in to the, the first day. And I just, you know, I... Uh, Loved their music and everything. We were like, getting along real well and everything. But it wasn't until like three days later that I realized it was you <laughs> playing the guitar. Because mm-hmm. you, you, mm-hmm. you're kind of like me. You've got the baby face disease. You know what I mean? You're going to look, you know, uh, 22 for the rest of your life probably. Uh, and so I just <laughs> Thank you. Think, I was like, holy <laughs> shit. Because uh, we I think we played Southampton or something like that. And uh, y'all were loading in. And just one of the, the local guys was like, holy shit, it's Billy Steer. You know, and I just I just put two and two together, and I was like, "Oh, <laughs> fuck me sideways!" And uh, I got super nervous, man, because uh, it's just I don't know. You're, you're like I said, you're one of my favorite guitar players, but it, it was a real treat. Um, well, thank you. Get, getting to watch y'all play every night, because uh, yeah, it was just uh, I had really only known you from Carcass at the time, and so seeing you just like shred mm-hmm. this boogie rock stuff, I was just like, "God damn, y'all are on fire!" And uh, I love how you play. Um, I think it was a melody maker you had at the time, right? Or do you still play? Oh, well, or? yeah. that... Yeah, I mean, I play Melody Makers with Carcass, but with Gents, it, that was, uh, like with Firebird, I was playing Juniors. Um, okay, yeah, they're Junior they're very similar beasts, really, yeah. but, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I like that guitar. It's just so minimalist. That's what I mean. I, I'm, I'm really finding myself becoming a lot more minimal these days with gear and stuff. I used to have, like, way too many pedals on my board, but I've, I've found that um, I can do a lot more if I'm working with less. I just, I, I use my hands more. Yep. 
you know and, and think, exactly i think it's very distracting if you've got tons of stuff at your feet mm -hmm. um yeah i mean obviously we're all different but i i've I always found it difficult to split myself in that way yeah you know i'd rather like you said i'd rather focus on the hands and and the music that's happening around me mm -hmm. you know and also it's like less stuff to to, to break if you're on tour you're always flying around yeah you know, having, uh, oh yeah yeah there's so many things that can go wrong. I mean, uh, you know, when I see somebody who comes out with a massive pedal board, uh, in a way I'm full of admiration because I think that that's brave because you've, you know, increased the, the, the potential of a disaster, you know, for the <laughs> evening. You know, because all it takes is one little, you know, patch lead or something to go wrong and, you know, and you've messed up half a track. Exactly. You know? And then you have to, like, the only way to really figure out what's going wrong is just to plug directly into your amp. You know, and then if yep. it still works, then oh, yeah. the show must go on. So you just turn the gain up and then wail that way. And then that's you end up sounded a lot better, usually because you're not killing your signal with a hundred different pedals. Going yep, through there, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But uh, but uh, that was, like I said, that was 2011. That might have been the last time I'd fucking seen you. Uh, so it's mm. crazy, like, what's happened since then. Because I remember you saying that you probably weren't going to do another Carcass record. Because I, I saw you all at Emo's. In like 2008 or 2009, and it was just one of the craziest shows of my life. Actually, this is really funny because at the time, um, it was you know in Austin, Texas, in August, it's 110 degrees outside at midnight, and um, mm. whenever y'all were playing, uh, I, I had on some van slip-ons with no socks and um, a pair of shorts. And then at emos back in the day, people used to just like smash bottles on the ground or like you know just it, it was mm. total chaos in there. And they also had these porta potties in the back that they didn't really empty as often as they should. It was a disgusting <laughs> shithole of a club. But uh but y'all were absolutely phenomenal. I never thought I would get to see you and so I was just really, really excited and I was um got a little inebriated. And um as I'm standing Good. there uh watching you guys destroy the place, I my foot felt a little wet. And uh, I, I reached down into my shoe and I pulled it out and it was uh, full of blood. I was like, Oh crap, wow. what happened? So I Shit. kinda took my shoe off and then um, uh, looked in it, and a piece of glass, like somebody had broken a bottle, like a real small piece of glass had gotten in there, and I must have walked around, and it cut my foot up a little bit. And as I, oh, I was kind of drunk, and I lost my balance, and I stepped down into this puddle that was obviously coming out of one of the porta potties. <laughs> so I was yeah, oh, sitting no. there, standing in a puddle of piss, uh, bleeding everywhere at a carcass show. I was like, this is perfect, actually. This is <laughs> wonderful. So I went to the bar, and I ordered two shots of whiskey. And I did one shot, and I poured the other shot in my shoe. Uh, to oh, good move! <laughs> yeah, I was going to say you need some kind of antiseptic or something. Yeah, <laughs> so that was the first time I, I ever saw Carcass. But um, but I remember you saying that you probably weren't going to make a new record. So by the time uh, Surgical Steel came out, I was thrilled, and it is a I mean a damn near perfect record. I love um, just how it starts. Sort of, it, it's almost like a. A carcass greatest hits of all new material because it starts off super brutal and then just like th then it kind of in the middle gets more melodic and then toward the end even um, the bonus tracks are super plotting mm. and just uh, a lot slower kind of like mm. you know, swan song and stuff was that intentional or was that did that just kind of happen that way yeah it sort of happened that way because we we'd recorded deliberately too much material mm -hmm. you know we smart um, we figured we had roughly an album and a half and then, you know, we just record everything and then when we're at the mixing stage, we'll figure out which songs go on the album and the, the remainder will go on the EP. Mm -hmm. So that was always the plan. And then that also became the plan with, with Torn Arteries, by the way. But, yeah, I mean, with that running order, it, yeah, it starts in a very relentless fashion on, on Surgical Steel. And I think... We, we batted around various ideas between the three of us, you know, Jeff, Dan, and myself. But Jeff had the most workable idea. Um, so that's pretty much what we went with. Mm -hmm. And then with Torn Arteries, the way that's uh, like rolled out is a little bit more the way Dan and I kind of, like Jeff didn't fully agree with us, but he was sort of outvoted and didn't have a, you know, didn't appear to have a better solution to the the issue so yeah you know that that record obviously comes out in a different fashion you know there's more clear variation between tracks you know from one to the other there is but yeah the, the, the way surgical comes out the gates it's just it's you know it's pretty frantic it's such a great record i mean I, i'm not knocking any bands when i say this but you know there was um in in your hiatus or absence or whatever you want to call it 
um, tons of bands that were obviously influenced by you rose to the surface. Uh, you know, like uh, like Skeleton Witch uh, comes to mind immediately, and uh, you know, very very good death metal bands. Don't get me wrong, but when y'all came out with yep. Surgical Steel, you just destroyed everybody. I mean, it was instantly ten times better than any band out there, and it was uh, such a pleasure to see y'all like back on the road again, just doing it. Um, it left me speechless. It is absolutely perfect record. It's awesome. Oh, cool. Thank That's you. That's all I have to say. No question. Sorry. I'm <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, uh, after, after doing that, I mean, like, and it's interesting uh, hearing that uh, the band is, sounds like a democracy. At least uh, everything's up for uh, a vote and everyone has an equal Well, side. yeah, in some ways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it depends a, on what the subject is. Yeah. That's but, yeah, it is, it's mostly democratic. Yeah, that, that's always interesting because it can sometimes just like, stall out everything and make things take way longer than they should just because nobody can agree on anything. Uh, yeah, yeah, precisely. So maybe democracy <laughs> isn't the best. <laughs> when it comes no, to, no, when exactly. It comes I mean, metal bands. Oh, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah and okay. I think, um, I, I, you know, every band's got a different dynamic, but, yeah. but with us and probably quite a few other bands, um, there's there's usually... A clear leader um in our case that would be jeff you know because mm. he's not just the front person the lyricist the visuals guy he's also kind of managing the whole thing nice. you know we don't have a, a separate manager so for the most part you know when it comes to a ruthless decision it's going to be him mm -hmm. um i mean with the musical contents that's probably a little bit more driven by me because I bring in, in the raw material to rehearsals when we're working on tunes. Mm -hmm. But even then, you know, he has a huge say because, you know, he's very opinionated on arrangements and direction stuff. Um, but it's, yeah, generally we, between the three of us, Dan, Jeff and I, we sort of often take votes on things. I mean, sometimes I've, I've disagreed with them, but you know, there's nothing I can say or do because I'm outvoted two to one. Mm -hmm. And and you know down the line it's it's quite nice to know yeah I was totally wrong on that they were right and it's nice <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I didn't get that one you know didn't win that victory right yeah and uh, it's interesting to hear that he's the the sort of the leader of the art direction because I the the second that I saw the new artwork for torn arteries I was <laughs> I, I just laughed out loud because I just I I felt like I instantly got it but um it was uh, I actually saw it before. I knew it was the art. It was like some, something on Twitter came up and it was a picture of that, the heart made out of vegetables and everything. And mm. it just, somebody commented like new carcass record looks awesome. And I, I, I laughed out loud. I was like, well, I, I, I could see them doing that. And then some like a, an hour later or something like that, I saw like the ad for the record. And I was like, Oh my God, that really is the cover. That's that. That's mm. so great, man. It's just uh really stands apart um, from everything else, but it, it's so perfect just cause uh, y'all have been vegetarian for so long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i i honestly don't know what what his intention was with this um <laughs> and you know i i wouldn't bother to ask really um i don't know i'd get a, you know a very clear answer but um it seems so I, I think right? it's yeah and i think maybe it's gone according to plan because it's polarized opinion quite strongly mm -hmm. um so i think he probably appreciates that just that it's got people talking yeah, and the other thing is it doesn't look like the quintessential modern day metal album cover so yeah i think he's probably quite happy in that regard yeah i bet um and uh i, I saw the the animation of it that they put it all together all the pictures of it just uh steadily rotting away and everything like that oh yeah um, it was just uh, i thought it was brilliant i mean like there's because nobody else like, what are you gonna do like but you know every metal band cover has like some you know like a evil preacher on it or something like that or just like some you know dead body all or something like that but yeah it was just it's so fresh and uh so unique i really appreciated it um oh, cool the, the the riffs on that record are just absolutely insane it's just like there's i don't even know how many the notes per square inch on that thing are just <laughs> nuts and this kind of this might be a silly question because people have asked it to me and um i've I don't really think about it because just when you write music, it's just, I don't know, it's just kind of in my brain. Whenever I write a song, it's just in there, no mm. matter how many notes are in it or whatever like that. But over the years, as you're getting ready for rehearsals and stuff, do you find it hard to remember like <laughs> every single one of those towering riffs? Or are they just in your brain? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think it's not even in the brain. It's in your kind of your central nervous system, uh -huh. you know, 
just from from sheer repetition and the feeling you have for the music. The the problem begins for me is when the brain engages. You know, you'll be at a rehearsal or or heaven forbid, at a gig, and then uh, <laughs> you, you, your brain kicks in. Oh God, that's dreadful. You know, I, I really have a problem with that when people, you know, or like when we've had different guitar players come uh -huh. in on second guitar and they're asking for uh, a breakdown of this particular riff. Yep. As soon as I start to slow it down and analyze it, I start to lose it, it. Right, so, absolutely, yeah. I know exactly yeah. what you mean. Yeah. Sometimes sometimes when I'm on stage and, and really going, so, I, I find myself forgetting to breathe. I, I know what you mean with like, don't, don't you oh, breathe. Yeah. I almost shut oh, everything yeah, completely, down. yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Like a, a minute yeah, you've been you've by. been holding your breath like thirty seconds or something. Yeah, and then you, then all of a sudden you're like, oh shit, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, uh, what's um? You said you uh, got a, a couple festivals coming up, but uh, I mean, is is it looking like things are uh, opening up over there? Um, yeah, I mean, it, def it definitely has here in the UK. I mean, gigs are a thing once again. That, mm -hmm. That's lovely. Um, but also, I think people have got, you know, what's the word? They've got one eye on the possibilities of, you know, some more restrictions um, yeah. because we've seen those kind of U-turns from, from the government and so forth uh -huh. before. But at the moment, things things are quite nice and it looks like it's moving forward in a cautious way. So that's, that's brilliant. Um, officially, we've got some stuff lined up for next year, you know, like... That that behemoth Arch Enemy tour that we were supposed to be part of, mm -hmm. I think it's been rescheduled. So we'll be going, in theory, going across Europe with those guys at some point next year. Nice. And I heard something about a tour with a Monomath in the USA. Um, all all of these things, you know, you don't want to get too carried away thinking exactly. it's definitely happening. It, it you, just, all, you can't really feel yeah. that right now, you know. And I mean, I've, I've, fingers crossed for that amount of through. That would be absolutely amazing. I, I really hope to see you all again uh, out there mm. just because you're one of my favorites. And I, I, another reason that I, I, y'all resonate with me so much is that, and maybe this is just my personal opinion, but Jeff's a real funny guy, you know, and he has no problem just <laughs> taking the piss out of the whole crowd, you know, and y'all aren't a band that talks to the crowd like you're a bunch of pro wrestlers or like they're a bunch of idiots or something like that, you know, or maybe they are a bunch of idiots, you know what I mean? And just, uh, that's what I, I love about it because it seems as if you don't take yourselves too seriously. And I think that's really important in heavy metal. Oh yeah. Well, that's good to hear. I mean, yeah, I think that that's the angle he's coming from, you know, it's just better to be honest about who you are, mm -hmm. you know? Um, cause yeah, I mean, N not to you know name names or anything, but you know occasionally I've seen bands where the guys on stage saying stuff to the crowd that's uh, just not him. I mean, it's just yeah, like the person the person privately is kind of one way, and then they become someone else entirely. Now, I mean, I'm not saying that you know none. I mean, all of us kind of bring out a, a certain element of our personality mm -hmm. when we're on stage. You know. You can't be completely the standard day-to-day, -day, you know, quiet, boring person on stage. So you bring out, you know, whatever that the, the more kind of edgy element of you is. Mm -hmm. But still, it's a part of you. And sometimes you see people, and it's just such a complete role play. It's it's yeah. almost embarrassing, you know. I think it's best to, if you can try and avoid that, you know. You, you know who you are out there <laughs> yeah just, yeah saying. yeah <laughs> well man thank you so much for taking the time out to come on the show man i really appreciate it it was uh, just some absolutely awesome insight uh, to some questions that i've had for such a long time about carcass and um yeah I, I, again just one of my favorite guitar players i'm really looking forward to everything else y'all have uh, oh thank you God. Cheers. absolutely i always oh, have um, appreciate it absolutely and uh, i have um whenever we have a musical guest on i ask if they want to play a a song off the new record. Is there any uh, particular track off of Torn Arteries that uh, you want to play for the people? Yeah. I mean, I think m right now my favorite one would be In God We Trust towards the end of the record. Hell yeah. Absolutely. Well, we're going to play that right now. Uh, again, Bill, thank you so much, man. Tell everybody else I said hi to. Will do. Yeah, thank you, sir. All Cheers. Right. Bye, brother.
so much for tuning into the highway this week. A big shout out to Reverend Guitars, Railhammer Pickups, and Earthquaker Devices. If you liked what you heard, you can follow where you can follow, subscribe where you can subscribe, and if you want to go one step further, you can support us on Patreon at The Highway with Kyle Shutt. For a few bucks a month, you can help us keep this party going, get early access to next week's episode, and even get yourself a shout out. <laughs>